It's always the most anticipated award show in Hollywood. It's all about the stars, the red carpet, and the hottest films of the year. It's the Academy Awards where stars are born and dreams are made a reality. That's right, and WEBN's special Oscars presentation behind the scenes in Hollywood starts right now. This year marks the 89th Academy Awards and WEBN is taking you behind the scenes in Hollywood. I'm Angelina Salcido. And I'm Shayna Ferreira. They say only the best take home the golden statue. We start with Hacksaw Ridge, which is up for Best Picture. I sat down with two of the film's producers who explained what it took to create this war movie. Hacksaw Ridge tells the extraordinary true story of Desmond Doss. Private Doss does not believe in violence. Do not look to him to save you on the battlefield. A pacifist and the only American soldier in World War II to fight on the front lines without a weapon. When producer David Permute heard Desmond's story, he couldn't believe it. I had known that medics were trained in, in riflery because they couldn't go up to the front lines without, uh, you know, weaponry. So combat medics. So it didn't make any sense. I couldn't believe the story when I first heard it. And then, of course, I found out it was true. Permute worked with Bill Mechanic and Mel Gibson to create the film that's nominated for six Oscars. So how come you don't fight? Are you thinking better than us? No. Producers knew Andrew Garfield was the right fit for the leading role. We had other people interested, but when Mel came on board, he asked, "Who was I? Who was I talking to, or who would it? Who did I think could do it?" And I gave him two actors, somebody else who I thought was very good, but I thought the best one was Andrew. And he's got Spider-Man. He could capture all the essence of Desmond Doss. You know, he's such a thoughtful actor. There's so much going on behind his eyes. And Desmond Doss, you know, a very solitude individual with such strong convictions and a man of few words, but a, a very inner strength. And I knew Andrew could convey all those elements. The main message of the film is one that has the power to change people's lives. You're always preaching to the choir in a sense, but you know, you wish the bad guys in the world would watch the movie and and it would if it would made you know one person who might have um, acted out of violence to not you then you did your job. Hacksaw Ridge is up against the film Arrival for the top film honors. The film depicts a visit from outer space aliens and one professor has to interpret their language. Producer Aaron Ryder told our WBN reporter Melanie Camacho how the film developed. Aaron Ryder said that the film is more than just about aliens. He says it's about communication and teamwork, and this makes the film feel timely. In, in the time that we're living right now, a movie that is about communication and, and working well together feels really timely. This sci-fi thriller has aliens landing in a dozen different countries. They don't come out of their spaceships, so the government recruits Dr. Louise Banks, played by Amy Adams. <gasps> She decodes the aliens' messages. The beings are mysterious in every way from their language to their appearance, but Aaron Ryder says this was all intentional. So that was important for us to have a slow reveal of what these aliens would ultimately look like. So we're seeing, first we're seeing them very much clouded in the mist. So you can't quite see them. Then you're understanding, is that an eye? Is that his face? The team wanted to create aliens differently from one scene in other blockbuster hits like E.T. and Aliens. We talked to a lot of uh, astrophysicists and, and uh, astronomy folks just to kind of get a sense well, what would they look like. Producing is no easy feat, especially on a limited budget of $50 million. Aaron Ryder said that it was made for a fraction of what other studios would have done. The actors had their fair share of challenges too. Amy Adams had to talk to aliens who obviously weren't there. You know, she has to emit all of that, or emote all of that emotion, acting opposite a tennis ball on a stick. Amy Adams has never won an Oscar, although she has been nominated five times. We now move from Best Picture to Best Documentary Feature. The Netflix documentary 13th explores how race affects the criminal justice system and mass incarceration. Producer Spencer Averick told me how difficult it was to tell this shocking story. Just absorbing this, these images and um, really um, putting myself in that time and just really thinking about it and living with it uh, was very hard. Producer Spencer Averick is talking about the realities of mass incarceration. 
According to the film, one in three black men will be sent to prison in their lifetime. But the story went well beyond the statistics. And once she started to get into it, um, uh, started peeling back the onion, we started to realize there was way more to it than just um, you know, a prison population a problem. The documentary brings viewers through 150 years of history. First, it recaps the emancipation of slaves to the Jim Crow South and ends in 2016. Each era served a purpose that revealed the relationship between the criminal justice system and the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment freed slaves, but sort of kept it open a little bit. There was a loophole in there that said, if you're convicted of a crime, basically you're not free. Afric says once he began to dig deeper into the history of slavery, the connections to today were shockingly similar. And that's evolved and mutated uh, until this day. A major part of this film's content was based from a book called The New Jim Crow by author Michelle Alexander. It sets forth the concept that mass incarceration is modern day slavery. So many aspects of the old Jim Crow are suddenly legal again once you've been branded a felon. And so it seems that in America, we haven't so much ended racial caste, but simply redesigned it. As the producer of the documentary, Avrik learned something too. I walked away with um, a, just a greater sense of, of American history. And uh, maybe I, w I walked away with an anger too, and, and a, um, an awareness. We want people to be aware of this problem. And we want people to know that there has not been a resolution to this problem, but we need to understand it and we can't be complacent. Avrik believes whether or not he brings home the Oscar with director Avrik DuVernay, the recognition from audiences around the world was more than enough. The film called White Helmets is a documentary in the short category. Our WBN reporter Ciara Speller shows us how it focuses on those who risk their lives every day in Syria. The White Helmets gives audiences a look into the lives of the men and women who saved countless Syrian civilians caught in the middle of this civil war. It was a story which just really inspired us. Um, I think, you know, myself and Joanna, our producer, we're, we're drawn to stories of people that not only remind us in um, how great human beings can be, but also make us want to be better people in, in our own lives. Orlando Von Enzadel is the director of this Academy Award winning documentary about heroes who cut through the politics of the Syrian civil war to save lives. The White Helmets are just remar re truly remarkable people. They are, they are gentle, they are humble, they are, they are, they are incredibly kind, they're very much driven by their faith, um, their motto is to save one life, is to save all of humanity. Von Enzadel said that in the last three years, the White Helmets have saved 82,000 lives, but one life that they saved in particular is especially remarkable. We felt that the clip you're referring to where this two-week-old baby is rescued from the bottom of a building which has collapsed, um, we felt it symbolized the hope that they represent, and, um, and you know, that, that's why we felt it was important to include in the film. The White Helmets aren't the only ones that are hopeful their work will make a difference. Von Enzadel believes that this documentary can build a bridge to show Syrians in a positive light. There, we are living through a period of immense misunderstanding and prejudice and division. We feel it's so important for the voices of people from places like Syria, of Muslims to be here and to talk. Um, and also the message of compassion and understanding that the White Helmets embody is one that we could all do with, with hearing a lot more often. This is Orlando Von Enestel's second Oscar nomination for a documentary short subject. And though he wouldn't tell us what was next for him, he said we can expect something new. Back to you, Shayna. Music can have the same power as documentaries. When we come back, the word lion will mean something other than wildlife. We will also take you behind the scenes with the sound editor from Deepwater Horizon. Stay tuned. Welcome back to WEBN's special Oscars presentation, Behind the Scenes in Hollywood. Often music will drive a film, and that is especially true for the movie Lion. Composers Hauschka and Dustin O'Halloran told our WEBN reporter Gina Brazau why they should win an Oscar for Best Original Music Score. Both Hauschka and O'Halloran stressed that honesty was their main goal throughout the film, seeing as the music in Lion played a major role in how this story was told. Music made magic in the Oscar-nominated film Lion. 
Dustin O'Halloran and Haushka are up for music original score after they composed the soundtrack for this movie in just two months. Our challenge was to find a way to create an emotional space that helped tell the story and helped propel the story, but but didn't but left room for people to to be inside of it, for the characters, for, for the acting, because it's. Uh, it's a fine line between pushing the emotion in a film like this that already has so much emotion. Both composers say the collaboration for this project was a happy coincidence and agree that the score was not just about the composition but also the execution. Almost all of the music was recorded in one long piano take to capture the authenticity of the character's emotion. One of the biggest challenges was a 13 minute scene with nothing but music. Most difficult maybe was this long cue this 13 minute cue that was actually uh, whatever the journey when he is uh, finding his home that is just like because there were so many scenes next to each other and there was the music was not stopping and it was a one piano take and finding the right you know like finding the right parts for each scene but they that they don't feel like a clue to a clue together you know that it's just one composition i think that was something that we that we were working on pretty long. Both composers are professional musicians and play their own music around the world, but for them, being able to work on a project like this means more than any award. I think it's a little bit like when you cry and you see yourself crying and you think, why, I am, why am I crying? Or if you like really cry because you're deeply touched. And I think this movie has the potential for, you know, just going home and you just think about your life or you, you think about what what you can do or how you can change certain things. Because I think, to be quite honest, I mean, we are not long on Earth, so I think this is something that uh, matters, this, like, a kind of true feeling. Lion is nominated for six Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Cinematography. Back to you, Angelina and Shayna. Thanks, Gina. Sound is essential to bringing a story to life, and editing the music, dialogue, and sound effects together takes an extraordinary ear. That's right, Shayna. Our reporter, Philippe Gonzalez, spoke with Wiley Statement, the sound editor for the film Deepwater Horizon, to see how he put it all together. Statement's main message is about the art of his craft and why his job continues to play a relevant role in Hollywood. And our intention is to tell a story that's almost impossible uh, to see in real, in real life. Wiley Statement is the sound editor of Deepwater Horizon, a movie about the worst oil spill in U.S. history that happened in 2010 off the coast of Louisiana. Statement explains why this film was made. You know, our goal uh, for Deepwater Horizon wasn't to let people get to know and understand well drilling. It was about letting the people get to know and understand the types of people that do this very dangerous work. One of the most interesting things about this project is how they created the sounds yeah. no one has ever yeah. heard before. The Deepwater Horizon is really about technologies that aren't, that we're not capable of actually seeing and experiencing. So we had to interpret those things and we had to create sounds for the blowout preventer. We had to create a sense of maybe the bottom of the, the floor of a, at a mile of depth of the gulf and what that might have been sounding like as this whole, you know, um, blowout presenter failure was occurring. Statement and his crew immersed themselves in their work in order to create an experience for the audience. Statement believes it is necessary for him and his team to understand how the audience would feel. So as we're working on scenes, the, the, the tremendous, you know, fire and destruction scenes that occurred below in the crew quarters of Deepwater Horizon, we're stressed out and that's when that's when you begin to sort of know how to shape these things and and make these impatiencies part of the tools that you use in order to bring the audience closer to the experience. Statement's work for Deepwater Horizon is now being used by Dolby Atmos as a demonstration of the capabilities that sound has. Production design is often as important as sound, and that is proven in the film, Hail Caesar. Our WEBN reporter Javier Rodriguez met with production designer Jess Gonker to learn why he has been nominated for an Oscar. Jess Gonker was thrilled to find out he was nominated for an Academy Award. He told me what it was like to work on the film, Hail Caesar. Jess Gonker brought his designs to life on the set of Hail Caesar. 
The film follows a day in the life of Eddie Mannix, the Hollywood fixer for Capitol Records in the 1950s. Goncher said he did a lot of research to get the 50s look just right. Hail Caesar is, you know, loosely based on uh, the MGM studios of uh, 1950 when they were, uh, you know, it was just a movie factory cranking out probably a movie, uh, delivering a movie a week. And um, so I really drew to all the inspiration of all the, the, the movies of, of 1950 from the, the old studio system of mainly of, of, of MGM. A lot of planning goes into each set. Goncher worked closely with the film's directors, Ethan and Joel Cohen, to get his designs from the sketchbook onto the big screen. He walked WEBN through the process of how it all works. So you have an idea, and I discuss it with Joel and Ethan, and I show them some pictures of a real thing or some sketches or something, and then we agree, okay, let's do it, and then put that into motion, and uh, it takes a, a lot, of, you know, a couple of hundred people to to make that happen um, as quickly as possible. Goncher spoke about some of his favorite sets and highlighted the mermaid ballet scene with Scarlett Johansson. We got to open up the tank that they built for Esther Williams. And we got to open it up for the first time since uh, she shot her movies there. It's been open, but they haven't used it for any, you know, water ballet things like we did with Scarlett Johansson. The production designer didn't expect to be nominated for an Oscar but said it was a wonderful surprise. I went into the living room, turned on the TV, and as soon as I got there, they were announcing the nominees for production design, and I think I was the third one, and they said, Hail Caesar! And I was like, what? So I just let out a big yell and woke up a few other people in the house. Goncher gave advice to aspiring production designers who dream that one day they will be nominated for an Oscar too. Find somebody that you respect and see if they'll take you on as a, you know, as a, as a men, uh, them, uh, you as a mentor or as a project and, you know, just to help um, get them going. But um, I think if you love what you do, there's nothing that's going to stop you. Goncher says he learns something new on every set he works on and he was grateful to be a part of this big film. The documentary short Watani My Homeland depicts one family struggle of surviving the turmoil of the Syrian civil war. Our WEBN reporter Ciara Speller talked with the director Marcel Metal-Sifen about the importance of telling stories that make an impact. The crew of this film followed one family for three years on their journey to find a new home while leaving their old and war-stricken Aleppo. It was a story which just really inspired us. Um, I think, you know, myself and Joanna, our producer, we're, we're drawn to stories of people that not only remind us in um, how great human beings can be, but also make us want to be better people in, in our own lives. Orlando Von Enzadel is the director of this Academy Award winning documentary about heroes who cut through the politics of the Syrian civil war to save lives. The White Helmets are just remar re truly remarkable people. They are, they are gentle, they are humble, they are, they, are, they are incredibly kind, they're very much driven by their faith. Um, their motto is to save one life, is to save all of humanity. Von Enzadel said that in the last three years, the White Helmets have saved 82,000 lives, but one life that they saved in particular is especially remarkable. We felt that the clip you're referring to where this two-week-old baby is rescued from the bottom of a building which has collapsed. Um, we felt it symbolized the hope that they represent and, um, and you know, that, that's why we felt it was important to include in the film. The White Helmets aren't the only ones that are hopeful their work will make a difference. Von Enzadel believes that this documentary can build a bridge to show Syrians in a positive light. We are living through a period of immense misunderstanding and prejudice and division. We feel it's so important for the voices of people from places like Syria of Muslims to be here and to talk. Um, and also the message of compassion and understanding that the White Helmets embody is one that we could all do with, with hearing a lot more often. This is the first Oscar nomination for director Marcel Metelsifen, and he is hopeful that his documentary will continue promoting awareness on the refugee crisis. Last year's lack of diversity at the Oscars prompted an uproar in the film industry and even led many to boycott the awards. They used the hashtag OscarsSoWhite. 
Gil Robertson is the president of the African American Film Critics Association. He has been at the forefront of the conversation on race in Hollywood, so he gave me his prediction of the future of diversity in the motion picture industry. It was a good year in the industry in terms of diversity. Uh, how inclusive it's been, that's another story. The film industry has improved its efforts in recognizing diverse films and stories from different communities, but Robertson says that's just one layer of the issue in Hollywood. And I think in order for us to achieve diversity, it's going to mean that we all have to give up something. And that something is really an opportunity for other voices and faces to be seen and heard on the silver screen. You know, I mean, for too long in this country, you know, when people talk about diversity, they talk about it in terms of black and white. It's going to mean that for black people, People that we are not the primary um, beneficiary of, you know, the diverse piece of the pie anymore. Uh, it's going to mean that uh, we're going to have to share that with Asians and Hispanics and Muslims uh, and women. It's going to mean that whites are going to have to share a bigger portion of their pie with the overall uh, group of people so that everyone, you know, can at least know what the pie tastes like. One highlight of the diversity controversy is support for the movies. Robertson says those chosen to be made are because of demand and profit. This is a business. It's business show, not show business. So we can't expect, we can't cry wolf and say racist if you're not going out and supporting the films when the system decides to deliver them. Robertson says Hollywood still has a long way to go. The industry is, is male helmed. You know, men run the business and people tend to naturally gravitate to images that are a reflection of themselves. So if you're not happy with uh, a movie or uh, something that you see in a movie or on TV, most TV shows and films have websites or some sort of social media attachment. It provides a platform for uh, consumers to um, voice their happiness or disappointment about a particular project. The African American Film Critics Association has applauded the Academy for its recognition of black artistry, but says the call for diversity is a longer term goal. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll give you a sneak peek of the Oscars after party. Don't go anywhere. There are multiple moving parts that go into an Oscar-nominated film, but one factor that draws the audience in is the visual effects. That's very true, Shayna. Visual effects have the power to captivate the audience. The movie Doctor Strange is no exception. Visual effects supervisor Steph Soretti worked hard to find balance between reality and fantasy dimension. Wire work, treadmills, and fight scenes. These are all elements that made the magic of visual effects shine in the film Doctor Strange. From pre-visualization to storyboards and script reading, visual effects supervisor Steph Soretti had the difficult task of finding a way to make the director's vision come to life. As soon as we start uh, shooting, I mean, I'm here on the set every day with uh, the director. Um, and we work together with the actors to uh, go through everything that we have to do. It's very technical, especially on Doctor Strange, we had a very technical shoot because everything was very precise and, and uh, we had prepared everything in, in pre-production to make sure that we would have all the equipment. In the movie, a brilliant but arrogant surgeon is taken under a sorcerer's wing after a massive car accident. There, he's trained to defend the world against evil. You're a man looking at the world through a keyhole, and you've spent your whole life trying to widen that keyhole. Soretti and the producers help the audience follow the story by placing the film in real-life locations like New York, London, and Kathmandu. These are grounding the film into reality. But then as soon as you get away from that and you go into all crazy dimensions and the colors and all the psychedelic stuff, we, we try to transition into these things um, in a way where in the edit and with the effects that we do, we bring the audience into it slowly or sometimes we go for, for a shock, like when he gets pushed through out of his body the first time, it's like, it needs to be a shock, so bam, you know, we throw that to the audience and we make them excited for what's coming later. But it's about finding the right pacing between the real world and the crazy world that we are putting around it. Does it ever come to the point where you just say no and you say that it's not possible? Uh, we don't. You don't? No, we never say no. Why not? Well, because we're here to deliver the vision of the director, right? So we can't say no, <laughs> right? So there's always a way. Um, 
we try to work to make it work. Soretti believes there are no limits to creating visual effects thanks to technology advancing. Animations can evoke strong emotions the same way other real-life films do. The short animation Pearl went above and beyond and did it in just six minutes. Director Patrick Osborne told Melanie Camacho how he made it happen. Pearl is a virtual reality short animation. It takes us along for the ride with a father and a daughter. It's a film about a dad and daughter who eventually settle into a house after living life on the road. Director Patrick Osborne says this story made him reflect about his dad, who was a toy maker. And there was a point where he, um, he, did, he worked at Kenner, a toy company in Cincinnati that made Care Bears and Play-Doh and stuff. And they were, about, they were sold to Hasbro and everybody had to move and he decided not to move so that my brothers and I could like, stay in the same place, in the same school. Osborne tells me this virtual reality film took over a year and a half to make once he partnered with Google Spotlight Stories. You know, you do about two months of like kind of proof of concept, working with the software, making a test shot uh, and writing, and then about six months of production after that. Osborne says the first thing on his to-do list was to establish a framework. And what better framework than pretending like you're sitting in a car? We needed some kind of set that didn't move. And the advantage of a, a car is that you can actually, instead of, instead of like a room, you can actually move the whole set. So you can have different lighting and color and weather and things like that. And it, you wouldn't be like stuck in one place. So. To bring the story to life, Osborne and his crew had to shoot it as if it were virtual reality and in 360 degrees. The film itself was basically shot in virtual reality. So it was almost like I sat in the car with an iPhone and recorded the, the show about 30 times. So we had about 45, 50 minutes of footage. And then we went to London uh, and with the help of an editor named Stephen Riley, who did a really cool documentary last year. He's a documentary editor. I sat with him and we, we cut together the film out of that, that footage as if it was like recorded in the car itself. The film didn't take home an Oscar, but Osborne says he's flattered by the publicity it has received. You can watch the film with the Google Spotlight Stories app on your mobile phone to get the special virtual reality experience. Two years ago, Patrick won an Oscar in the same category, short animation, for his work called Feast. An unusual true story from France has made its way into the running for best short action film. La Femme et le TGV chronicles the true story of Elise Le Fontaine, portrayed by actress Jane Birkin. RWBN reporter Javier Rodriguez discussed how a real story became a magical one with the producer and director of the film. Guten and Kudouf worked together to get this film nominated for an Oscar. They told me about their experience making this short action film. La Femme et le TGV tells the true story of a lonely woman who forms a bond with a TGV train driver. Elise wakes up every morning just in time to catch the train past her house. She grabs her Swiss flag and waves the train down as it zooms by. Elise was played by 70-year-old Jane Birkin. Guten and Kudouf said she was a joy to work with but it was challenging because they had to work around her health issues. Initially, actually, Jane declined the movie because she, she read all about all these biking scenes and she was like, I can't get on a bicycle. So Timo was like, no, 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 we're, we're going to figure this out. And he actually figured out a solution. We, when you watch the movie, uh, Jane Birkin never rides a bike. We had a, a double. <laughs> a lot of thought went into selecting a house to shoot the film in. Guten and Kudouf hunted to find the perfect spot. We were thinking of even shooting the film in the house it actually happened, since that's on the train tracks. But unfortunately, it's based on true events, so there are no more TGVs passing by the house, so we had to relocate and go on a location scout throughout Switzerland to find a house, and we didn't really find the perfect house, so uh, we extended the location scout to France, and. That's where we found our house. So the Mont Bijou you see in the film, it's actually not in Switzerland, but in France. Because the film was in French, subtitles were needed. Guten and Kudouf decided to take matters into their own hands and created the subtitles themselves. It's a uh, very hard work. <laughs> it takes forever till yeah. you find all the mistakes, till you have the right timing. In, in one way, even subtitles, they're really, they, they're very ar artistic right. value. They have artistic value. Mm. So it's important to be done right. 
La Femme et le TGV is nominated for one Oscar and stands uniquely as a French-based film. Action films usually rely on sound to transport us into the silver screen. That's right, our WEBN reporter Philippe Gonzalez caught up with the sound editors of Hacksaw Ridge. Wright and Mackenzie have never been nominated for an Oscar before, but the duo from Australia explains how the Battle of Steel came to life. It's all an interpretation. Um, I've never been in war. I've fired a gun a couple of times. You know, I know they were really loud and really scary. Um, but it's all about what that particular picture demands. And that picture won Andy Wright and Rob McKenzie an Oscar for Best Sound Mixing. They had also been nominated for Best Sound Editing. The unique sounds of the mortars that the audience hears but doesn't see help set the movie's tone. They fill out the background and make the scene more intense. So we created those by um, getting like a piece of dry ice and putting that on a sheet of metal and that vibrates and creates a really metallic screechy sound and then we grab that sound and and what we call doppler it um, which is you know when a car goes past and it goes zoo. so we put that sort of incoming sound on the screechy metal sounds mix it with a few other sounds sometimes even mix it with Mel's voice or some some female screaming or some animals screaming things like that both editors were able to impact a community of heroes in a personal way and there was some great some great feedback on on what Rob created from you know, actual veteran U.S. Uh, soldiers who had been in situations similar to this in modern day combat and they had commented on how uh, they felt it was the closest they've ever heard it to the real thing. The sounds of Hacksaw Ridge really gave audiences a roller coaster of emotions thanks to the work of Wright and Mackenzie. Hacksaw Ridge was a popular film for this year's Academy Awards with six nominations. Film editor John Gilbert told our Gina Berzow how he was able to merge all of the action. John says the most satisfying part of his job is getting the main message of the film across to the viewers through his editing. What is your delay, Captain? We're waiting, sir. Waiting for what? Private DOS. Who's Private DOS? That is the magic film editor John Gilbert created on screen in Hacksaw Ridge, and it won this year's Oscar for Best Film Editing. Gilbert worked closely with director Mel Gibson, who played an important role in piecing together this film. Uh, Mel was in the editing room all, all the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's passionately involved, and uh, he liked a lot, of what I've, a lot of what I'd done, but at the same time, there were certain moments in the film which were critical kind of uh, key story moments. It seems like that he was, uh, you know, at my shoulder, sort of, oh, a bit further, a bit less, a bit more, a few frames more of that and so on. He was kind of really involved and uh, that was great. Gilbert wanted audiences to establish a connection with the film's characters before the storyline was introduced. He thought this would give them a deeper connection to the story. Oh. Whoa! Oh, oh, oh. See like that. You've got to keep the audience involved. Uh, you've got to make sure that uh, there's a truth to, to each scene and in dialogue and emotional scenes. Uh, you know, that's critically important that the audience believes what they're seeing and the interaction between the two actors p feels real. On any given day, Gilbert could be sent three to six hours of footage. His next task was to find the most important scenes to edit first but the hardest ones are not always what you would expect. Get it. I'm going to drag you. Let's do it. The message of the film is, uh, you know, there are people out there that will do, will give up their lives for other people. It's, it's kind of remarkable that someone would do that. Our instinct for self-preservation is huge, and yet there are people that override that to do uh, feats of great heroism like Desmond Doss and uh, you know it stops you in your tracks. Gilbert stresses that working on quiet scenes can be the most challenging because you have to find a way to keep the audience involved. He's currently working on another project with Mel Gibson. Did you ever watch The Jungle Book as a kid? Of course that film is such a classic and now the animated film has been transformed into a live action movie. The visual effects were spectacular. And there's no surprise that it's nominated for an Oscar. The man who created those amazing visuals told me what it took to bring the film to life. Bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your strife. You know, it's a coming of age story of a, of a child raised by, by animals and having, like, you know, being able to kind of have a bear as your best friend. And, you know, it's just a really cool 
set up. Andrew Jones is the Jungle Book's animation supervisor. His job was to use visual effects, animation, and a special team to make a young boy's journey come to life. It's a lot of work and a lot of people, you know, a lot of artists involved in visual effects, you kind of go back to shoot a lot of elements once you have a sequence figured out. And this is, we kind of try to treat it like an element shoot. So we didn't have to overcover and shoot every angle that, you know, on the day in the stage because it would have been too expensive and take too long. This epic adventure of a man cub who's raised by wolves and later embarks on his own captivating journey of self-discovery went through three stages, pre-production, production, and post-production, and the visual effects aspect were present each step of the way. Joan says the biggest challenge was getting his director to like his work. John Favreau notoriously doesn't like visual effects, so it's, <laughs> and yet he's making a movie that's, you know, 95% visual effects. And um, but he, you know, but I really like that challenge of like he's saying if if I if you fool me, then I'm going to be happy. I'm going to like it if you, if I believe these animals are real. And um, that was the challenge. That was the bar he set. Through visual effects, Jones and his team were able to fool the audience into believing that what they see on screen is real. Have you lost your mind? You said you wouldn't get mad. Yeah, animation-wise, that's the holy grail of what we do. You know, we're always trying to fool audiences into thinking they saw us. They they think it's real. And it, it also brings them into um, a greater degree of, of understanding of the story or getting them to just forget that they're watching an effect or a magic trick and they're just engrossed in the story. No matter where you go or what they may call you, you will always be my son. Extreme makeup can be seen as a type of visual effect, and that's true in the Oscar-nominated film Suicide Squad. Makeup artist Alessandro Bertolazzi told Ciara Speller how he earned an Oscar nomination, creating superheroes Harley Quinn and the Joker. Alessandro Bertolazzi explained the big shoes he had to fill and recreating the looks seen in this film. <laughs> I want to build a team of some very bad people who I think can do some good. Alessandro Bertolazzi was the head makeup artist and hair designer for Suicide Squad, and his craft won him the Academy Award. Thinking about their incredible icon, all these people, their incredible icon, everybody knows there's a million of people talking about comics and everything. It was, this is what's the best, the biggest challenge. Feel responsible, not just to the studio, not just to the, the, the director as normally he is, but I was thinking about all these guys, this child, looking for see the new Joker. He said that the idea of recreating looks first seen on the original DC comic supervillains in real life made him apprehensive at first. Enchantress, Harlequin, Boomerang, all the rest of the character and Joker was made personally by me and my sister. It was really difficult, but there's no way to do different in different way if you want to do something practical. Bert Tolazzi said that he became invested in the storyline, which gave him the inspiration he needed. I start to make a big research. I ask for a big, huge room in the studios, not makeup room because I don't like a makeup room. It's to be like a laboratory, and it's beautiful where everything being created without any specific reason. Bert Tolazzi said being considered for an Oscar was a great honor but seeing the way fans embrace his creations means much more to him. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. This is, this is the whole world. This is make, this is the proof I made something really interesting, not just me with my team, George and Matt, of course, but this is the real proof. When asked about the future of his work in the industry, Bertolozzi says that he hopes to continue creating work for fans to connect with. Coming up after the award show, the audience has worked up quite an appetite. So to satisfy that celebrity hunger, legendary chef Wolfgang Puck serves up just what the stars want to eat. All that and more when the WEBN 2017 Oscar special presentation Behind the Scenes in Hollywood returns. Oscar doesn't have to go through much on the day of the awards, but that's not true for everyone else. After a long day of getting glammed up, getting pictures taken, and accepting awards, you've got to be hungry. But executive chef Wolfgang Puck knows how to fix that. Certainly, I visited Chef Puck's kitchen, and he showed me what he's cooking up for the biggest names in Hollywood. People love the chicken pot pie because it's real comfort food. Right. 
That's the key here, your comfort food. Comfort food, yeah, pop modernization. This year's Governor's Ball menu now features vegan and vegetarian-friendly options for guests. Eric here is making fresh pasta. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, so we have a pasta maker here, there is no... Uh, egg in here, no animal products. It's only water, olive oil, salt, and semolina flowers. This year's menu also has a Hollywood favorite, Oscar-shaped salmon. Smoked salmon Oscar, oh that has become one of the traditions already. So we really make 3,000 of them. 3,000 individuals. 3,000 individual Oscars. So we have to cut the bread first and then step out the Oscars. We smoke 60 sides of smoked salmon. So 30 whole salmon with uh, uh, cut it in half. But no menu is complete without good old-fashioned cheeseburgers and pizza. Pizza. But you can't forget the dessert. Yeah, you know, we're gonna have a big chocolate buffet. We're gonna have a chocolate fountain, and then we're gonna have my favorite cake here, the Marshall Land. We're gonna have little chocolate souffles, little tiramisu, all kinds of cookies. One of the great things people love is the macaroons. But Chef Puck's signature dessert for the governor's ball is the chocolate Oscar. Naturally. Everybody will get a chocolate Oscar for us. You know, we make some of the big ones. They are all out of chocolate, and we paint them in 24 karat gold. And if you're wondering at home if the gold is edible, it's pure chocolate inside. A sure way to keep the guests at the governor's ball smiling and their star bellies full. This is Chef Puck's 23rd year cooking the food for the Governor's Ball, and he shows no signs of slowing down. Now, it wouldn't be a show without an after party, so after the Oscars, the guests party at the Governor's Ball. And it's all up to executive producer Cheryl Chiquetto to make it the talk of the town. She told Javier Rodriguez how to dazzle Hollywood's most treasured stars year after year. With the Oscars just around the corner, Cheryl Chiquetto is working hard to make sure this Governor's Ball is one to remember. I just want them to walk in the door and gasp and say, wow, I'm here celebrating the Oscar. We're going to see those Oscars move through the room. And shortly after they get through the room, they'll be engraved here. And I want them to feel like we've dressed the room not only with sights, but with sounds and food and energy and waiters, that they're at the governor's ball. Six months ago, Chiquetto and the governor's ball chair, Jeffrey Curlin, began searching for ideas for the big night. They found the inspiration for this year's ball from a photograph of a French pastry shop. It was a beautiful white pastry shop with these colored macaroons and Jeffrey loved the feeling of it. It felt clean, environment, environment was bright and wonderful. So it's this white palette with shots of gold and shots of red, which are going to go through a sea of red, so it's very transformational. And we're calling it a magical transformational evening. Chiquetto said every year she brings something new to the table, and this year is no exception. The look is completely different, the entertainment is different. We always try to shake it up with the menu, knowing that there's a lot of good favorites with um, Wolfgang Puck. Of course, your movies are different, so your guests are different. Chicago said if you're at the ball, you've earned it. She wants her guests to leave their stresses at the door and to have a spectacular night. Here, all bets are off. We're going to be eating those Kobe beef bur burgers and those uh, tuna cones and the macaroni and cheese loaded with black truffles, and we're going to enjoy it. We're going to celebrate. This event takes place once a year. So with that being said, I hope everyone really takes advantage of that three hours. Chiquetto wants the governors and the stars to end their glamorous night on a high note. And as the film directors here say, that's a wrap for WEBN's special Oscars presentation behind the scenes in Hollywood. We want to congratulate all who make the silver screen so memorable. Please check out our continuing coverage on our websites, webn.tv and webnontheredcarpet.com. We now leave you with the names of everyone who made this program possible. I'm Shayna Ferreira. And I'm Angelina Salcido. We will see you right here in Hollywood next year. Thank you for watching.